Hello, this is Carl Freund with Cambrian AI Research. And today I've got a very special guest to talk with you about what he and his company are doing to create the vision of, 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 of a smarter world. Uh, I've, I've got Nigel Toon of GraphCore. Uh, GraphCore is a very well-funded startup in the UK, uh, getting a lot of press, a uh, lot of attention to their software, a lot of attention to, uh, to uh, their, their hardware. And uh, welcome, welcome, to the, uh, welcome to the show, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. It's great to be here and talk a little bit about uh, GraphCore. Excellent. Excellent. Well, why don't we, I, I call this series the Cambrian AI Visions. So why don't we start with your vision, vision for AI and your vision for uh, GraphCore and how GraphCore will help create that new world. Yeah. So um, really going back to when we started the company, um, we went out and spoke to many of the leading innovators in and around uh, AI, um, you know, some really smart people that we were able to meet with. And I guess the, the thing that everybody said was they're being held back or felt they would be held back by today's hardware. And if you think about the problem that we're trying to solve here, you know, for, I would say for 75 years, we've told computers what to do step by step in a program, and now they're learning from data. Um, and, and that's a very different type of compute. And we can do some of that with today's processors. Um, but what we really need are processors that are able to have much more parallel operation to be able to deal with these very different data structures that we're trying to work on um, in AI. And I think if we can do that, we can let innovators create these next breakthroughs uh, in machine learning. Um, you know, the models are gonna be very big, the models are gonna be very complex. And so we need compute that can scale and compute that can deal with that data complexity uh, that is gonna be fundamental to creating these new breakthroughs. And that, that's what GraphCore's focused on, yeah, helping those innovators create those next breakthroughs, move beyond what we're currently able to do um, in, in machine learning. And, you know, another parallel that I sometimes use is um, in computer graphics, you know, there was a day when we used to have two dimensional computer games, right? You know, Pac-Man, um, and we used to build those as software on a CPU. And then along came the GPU, which was wonderful because it allowed us to build these three dimensional gaming environments. And, you know, now we get these hugely interactive games that um, are possible because somebody built this new type of processor that would accelerate 3D graphics. And you know, exactly the same is gonna happen in AI. You know, we've really been able to build the two dimensional um, machine learning uh, systems using today's CPUs and GPUs. And now we need the IPU, the intelligence processing unit to allow us to create these three dimensional um, uh, machine learning environments, actually many more dimensions. You know, that's one of the things, it's a very high dimensional problem. And that's why you need these much more complex uh, processes. So, so that's, that's really the vision here. Interesting, interesting. So where do you see that vision applying specifically in terms of the types of models that you've designed your chip to do and that you feel that are a good, a good fit for your chip really excelling in the marketplace? Yeah. Um, so if you think about how this whole space has evolved and you know, obviously we moved from machine learning to deep learning, um, many of the algorithms that we've applying in, in deep learning have actually been around since the 1980s. Um, and it was really the, the ability to have access to much more data, label data and compute that allowed us to get these uh, models to work. And, and that was really the first phase that we went through from about 2012 um, through to 2018 and where everybody was talking about you know, data being very expensive um, and having access to that labeled um, data to allow us to develop models that would generalize um, from that data to be able to build a model that could then be used to recognize other objects or, or whatever. And a couple of years ago, people started to make uh, new breakthroughs with uh, transformer-based models, where rather than having um, label data, you could just take large um, sections of data, say Wikipedia, um, and you could learn the semantic content of language. Um, from that. And, and we weren't using supervised learning anymore. We had this uh, unsupervised learning. 
And, and what people started to see there was that, you know, as you put more data and larger models, you could build, you know, more impressive uh, systems. And, and we've seen, you know, over the last couple of years, this evolution of models getting bigger and bigger and the data sets getting larger and larger. Um, and what's interesting is because every piece of data needs to work against every parameter in these models, the amount of compute is growing as a multiple CAD of those two pieces. And so the amount of compute is growing on this exponential um, basis. So, so, so we really need to find a way to break that because how do we move from today's you know, hundreds of billions of parameter models um, to trillions of parameters or you know, your brain, probably bigger than mine, um, 100 trillion uh, parameters um, or more um, inside the brain. So, so we've really got to move beyond this idea that everything is this dense compute problem to being much more a sparse um, compute problem. And I think that's, that's the way things are going to evolve. Um, over the next few years. We're going to move towards these much more complex, sparse um, data uh, machine learning models. And, and that's really, I think, where you're going to need that next step of hardware to be able to support that. Mm -hmm. I noticed that um, your, your, your second generation platform has a tremendously uh, increased amount of memory, both mm -hmm. on die and, and in, the, in the appliance itself. Where do you see that going in terms of processor and memory architecture, because as these models go into the trillions and then tens and then hundreds of trillions of, of parameters, uh, how do you keep that balance between, between memory and compute and storage? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, you know, it, it's existed in compute for a long time. You know, one of the challenges in compute is you're always trying to balance memory and compute you're trying to balance the bandwidth you have to memory and hide that latency behind uh, the compute that you're able to do. And certain problems are IO bound and certain problems are, are, are compute bound. And so finding that right balance of these new applications, you know, as they evolve to have much larger um, models and much larger data sets, you've got to get the right balance between um, hiding that latency to the external memory, getting access um, to that large memory. So, so one of the things from our, in our architecture that we realized very early, I think, was that you need a huge reservoir of memory right next to the compute. So when you're computing, you are not held back by the off-chip uh, memory. Mm -hmm. And if you build a big enough reservoir of data inside the processor, then you become much less uh, limited by the bandwidth to that external memory. So you can use, you know, existing DRAM that gives you the density that you might need, um, but you get the performance because all of your compute is happening on the data that is inside um, the processor. And, and with our second generation platform, we've really been able to engineer that uh, into the system um, and people are really seeing the benefits of that. And as we go forward, you know, we'll continue to drive the memory inside the processor and balance that with very large memory stores outside of the processor and use that reservoir to be able to deal with the latency um, between the compute and the, uh, the data access. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a fascinating time for silicon. Uh, but it's also a fascinating time for software because it's really a completely different way of programming a computer, letting the computer learn from data instead of being told what to do with it. Um, so maybe you can spend just a, just a couple minutes talking about your software stack, the challenges that you're working on and what you see is the next, uh, the next great hurdles that you intend to clear on the software side. Yeah, so, so the software is absolutely critical. You know, I think people often make the mistake of sit down, come up with this wonderful processor architecture, and then throw it over the wall to a software engineer and say, write a compiler for this. Um, and guess what? It doesn't work, right? Um, and one of, the, one of the problems is that as you put more and more parallelism into a processor, you know, you, not just data parallelism, but instruction parallelism as well, you know, and our IPU is basically a multiple instruction, multiple data machine the key is the communication. You communicate through memory by writing to memory and reading from memory through another uh, thread. Um, and you need a, an exchange inside um, the, the processor as well. And there's this, again, going back to the 
1960s, there was this uh, research scientist at IBM Labs uh, called Rents who, who came up with this understanding of IO, um, interconnect, and, and the amount of logic in, in what he was looking at. But the same applies to your brain, the same applies to processors. As you get more and more elements working on data, the amount of interconnect you need goes up on a power law. And so the first thing is you've got to get the processor architecture right. And then the second thing is you've got to get the computer science right so you can actually deal with all these different parallel threads that are running and create the synchronization between the two. And then you have an environment that allows you to write the software that actually can work across these much more complex uh, compute environments. And, that, and that's really what we built. You know, if you look at the IP that we have inside GraphCore, it's very much to do with the way the processes communicate with each other, the way you, we use the memory, the way we use this concept of what's called BSP, box synchronous parallel um, inside the machine to create an environment in which we can build software. And the software environment really comes from this idea that what we're fundamentally describing is a mathematical graph um, with intense compute at each of the vertexes and the edges connecting these, these elements of compute. When we write TensorFlow, we're describing a graph. When we write PyTorch, we're describing a graph. And so what our software environment does is it takes that graph description, it expands it into a full compute graph and then maps it to the available resources inside the processor, the processing elements, the data, the external memory. Um, and, and that's really what, what uh, Poplar is doing. And, and the thing that is probably not obvious from that is that we're breaking these graphs down into models that run on an IPU but we're also breaking the models down into models that run on multiple IPUs. And so we're not just parallelizing, you know, at a batch level, we're actually parallelizing at the model level um, as well as through Poplar. And I think that's quite a unique thing that, that we're able to do um, in our software compared to, to everybody else. And it's really the key to being able to make these, you know, very large models work um, across uh, complex hardware. So yes. you know, I think that the, the software and the hardware, you know, you have to develop those two together. You have to have an overarching understanding of how those two pieces come together. And I think very few companies are actually doing that um, in this space. Yeah, I think the uh, software first or software in parallel, pun intended, uh, sort of approach and design is really the way to go. And, and clearly with your large software team, complementing your hardware, does helping the en hardware engineers understand what the software needs, helping the software engineers understand what the hardware is best at. And that yeah. kind of collaboration is, is, is the only way we're gonna solve some of these really hard problems. Yeah. Well, Nigel, I really appreciate your time today. We look forward to having you back. Uh, I'm sure your company will have lots of uh, interesting things to share with us as the, uh, as the year progresses. And I wish you and, uh, and the GraphCore team uh, all the success in the world and uh, come back and see us soon. Okay. No, we look forward to that, Carl. You know, we'll, we'll come back and, and share our news with you. Thank you very much. Excellent. We look forward to it. Take care now. Yeah. Stay well. Bye -bye.